Heavenly Father, we thank you for this meeting. Again, Lord, we thank you for your presence in our very midst again tonight. You are our Lord and our God, and we are your people. Without you, we can do nothing. Therefore, we gather regularly in your holy sanctuary that, Lord, we might present ourselves to you in humility. And out of your mercy and your grace, bless us. Bless us in your word. Bless us in your anointing. Bless us in everything that goes on in your house here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all be seated. We're still continuing our Bible study and prayers. And tonight we're looking at a title, Come Into the Ark. Come Into the Ark. Come Into the Ark. And our scripture is from Genesis chapter 7. Genesis 7, verses 1 to 24. Genesis chapter 7, verses 1 to 24, which is more or less the whole of chapter 27 of Genesis. Come into the ark. Genesis chapter 7 verses 1 to 24. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal a male and his female, to each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Also, seven each of bears of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights. And I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah, with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood because of the waters of the flood. Of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two they went into the ark, of no to, the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them, Enter the ark. They and every beast after its, after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the, on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. And the Lord shut him in. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark. And it rose high above the earth. 
the waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubic cubits upward, and the mountains were the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth on the earth, bears and cattle and bees and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man, all in whose nostrils were the breath or the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bears of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Amen come into the ark. When you look at verse 1 or chapter 7, the very first, but then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Come into the ark. Before you can tell someone to come into something. That means you yourself you are there. Otherwise you say go into the ark. But the Lord said come into the ark. It means that God was actually inviting Noah and all that he wanted to save to be with him in the, in the ark. Later we're going to see how the ark is a type of Jesus Christ. Jesus is where he, Jesus is inviting us to come to him. So God did not say, Noah, go into the ark. But according to my Bible, God said, come into the ark. So God was already inhabiting, was in the ark. God was inviting Noah to come to be with him, to come into him. And that's how he was to save Noah and all that he saved. Beloved, as some of us know, the ark that we're talking about was a vessel built by Noah. Built by Noah. It was built to save himself. It was not that built for, 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 mer for merchant purposes, for trading purposes, or for that traveling. But it was built to save himself, his family, and the animal kingdom from the flood sent by God. That's the purpose of the, of the ark. Built to save. To save lives. To save life. It was not built for any other purpose but for the saving of life. Because God was about to bring judgment on the wicked. On all the wicked. The unrighteous. Who then inhabited the earth that God had created for them. This ark was about 450 feet long. According to the measurement given by God, it was about 450 feet long. 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. 450 feet. A very big vessel indeed. By the standard of those days. 75 feet wide and 45 feet high. And it had three decks. It wasn't just one spacious place, but it was decked. First deck, second deck, third deck. Three deckings. There were three floors. And after almost a year, as you have done read, after almost a year on the water, this ark floated on the water for almost a year. The ark came to rest on Mount Ararat. And Mount Ararat is known to be now in a place called Turkey. Turkey. Beloved, if you're hearing the sound of my voice, I want to entreat you to read 
And the next one we we must all read uh, Genesis 6, chapter 6, from verse 1. Genesis chapter 6 from verse 1 to chapter 9, verse 19. In the next seven days, or until we meet again, or next week, Friday, we all must try endeavor to read Genesis chapter 6, verse 1, from verse 1 through to Genesis 9, verse 19. Now, what is the theology behind this ark? We want to look at the theology behind the ark. Beloved, this ark reveals both the judgment and mercy of God. If we want to look at the theological doctrine meaning of this ark the ark reveals one or two of the most profound and important attributes of God and that God is the God who judges God always judges he's still judging and the time the, the time comes when he brings final judgment according to his own will. Judgment. But his judgment is righteous. His judgment is not flawed. There's no court of appeal. When God judges, his judgment is perfect, righteous. There's no one to appeal to, no court of appeal. There's no Supreme Court. There's no one higher than God and there's no one more righteous than God. So judgment, righteousness, at the same time, one of his attributes is mercy. Mercy and grace. In this story of what happened, we see all these three attributes of God at play, at work. Judgment, mercy and righteousness. We said that his judgment is righteous. His judgment is without flaw. It's without any mistake. And that's why no court of appeal. And in this case, it's righteous, God's righteous judgment is seen in the destruction of the wicked. So no one can sit back and say, oh, why did God do such a thing? Why did God destroy all living things? No one can criticize him. His judgments are righteous. Judgments belong to him, and his judgments are righteous. So whatever he does is by his own sovereign will, power, and authority. And they are righteous. Unlike the enemy, the enemy that we have to deal with, who, whose judges are flawed, not righteous, but they are wicked. No basis. Wicked. God's judgments are flawless, faultless, righteous. Therefore, God decided to destroy all living things because of sin. Because of sin. Not because of anything, but because of sin. Because of disobedience to his word. Because of non-recognition or lack of acknowledgement, lack of reverence, lack of worship. His sovereign presence, power and authority, God decided that the reason why he created man was no longer valid. That was that God God repented. God, God was sad that he had made man. He was sad that he had made man. And there's a time when we, we say the, the iniquities of the Amorites comes, it becomes complete. God is long-suffering. And therefore, many of us take God's long, because of his long-suffering nature, we take him for granted. And we assume that he doesn't even exist. 
Many people don't even think that God exists. And that even if he exists at all, he doesn't care. He doesn't mind. But the time comes when we say the iniquities of the Amorites become complete. There's a, there's a time when now one has crossed so many lines that God has no option, God has no choice but to bring about his righteous judgment on sinners, offenders, unrighteous, on the wicked. And that's what God did this time. He done it before and he's going to do it again. He is going to do it again. At the same time, he's merciful and caring. He's not a wicked God. In as much as his judgment is righteous, it means that he's also able to judge between the wicked and the righteous. He knows those who are righteous, those who are his children, and those who are wicked. Those who are righteous and children, he's merciful and caring. And here we see this attribute in a demonstration. God demonstrated his, this attribute by preserving Noah's life. Noah's life. And not just Noah, but through him of the whole human race. If one man, Noah, had not been righteous, all humankind would have perished. All mankind who have perished. God was able to single out Noah and his family out of the entire world, just Noah. So, beloved, the lesson here is that it doesn't matter where you are or how many sinners surround you. It is not important the environment that you find yourself in. It is not so important the people that you are moving with. No. What is important is your own personal standing with God. We live in an age where there's so much unrighteousness. There's so much disrespect for God and even his creation. And wickedness is progressing at a very fast pace. At a very fast pace. We have read today that even among the animals, they entered two by two, male and female, male and female, male and female, even among the animals. But we've come to an age now when many people in the world now dispute the fact and they believe that there are more genders than just male and female. There are more. So that you can be a man in a woman's body, you can be a woman in a man's body, and they, they have, man has come to create our own gender, which we call trans, transgender. Now we've completely disobeyed, disregard what God has created. But God is long-suffering. It doesn't mean that God is not aware. God knows. God is seeing everything. But Lord, God is long-suffering. God is long-suffering. Because God doesn't wish... He doesn't wish anyone to perish. He doesn't wish anyone to perish. Don't worry, we're all like that some time ago. Praise the Lord. God said, come into the ark. An invitation. Not ascending forth. An invitation. Because see, the ark is actually a type of Christ. Throughout history, because of the because the coming of Jesus Christ is so pivotal, it's such a huge game changer. It is what to bring the perfect thing that God wants to do to restore mankind to man's original status. The coming of Jesus is so pivotal. It's so hugely important that throughout the ages, God showed some things. God said this something that, that mirrored, that symbolized what Christ will come and do for us. 
So that when the time comes, the purpose of that is that so that when Christ comes, the time comes, we will have seen, we will have seen uh, many evidence of his work, many evidence of what he has come to do. So that now, what he will come to do will not come to us as a big surprise. It will not come to us as a big surprise. We have seen it before. God said, come into the ark. The ark is a type. It's a symbol. It's an illustration of Jesus who was to come centuries ahead. Centuries ahead. So, looking at the theology of the ark, we see Jesus in this story. We see Jesus coming to save the righteous and condemning the wicked. A type means that it is an illustration of Christ. It is a type in that he preserves us. The flood preserved the life of Noah and his family. Jesus is the one who preserves us from the flood of divine judgment through his grace. Talking of flood, in the last day, the judgment that will come will be like a flood. It will be a, it will be a flood of divine judgment in the last day. That will come to separate the sheep from the goats, preserve the goats, sorry, preserve the sheep and destroy the goats. And that's what we are talking about when we talk about the theology of the ark. Therefore, as many as entered the ark were saved. Even the animals who entered were saved. But whoever did not enter the ark died. Anyone who was not found in the ark died. And that's what it stands for. The Bible said that when they had all entered, God himself shut them in. God shut them in. When God has separated them, and the righteous had entered, God shut Noah and his family and all the animals, he shut them in. Now where God locked the door of the ark so that when the destruction came, no one, purpose of that, no one who was found outside who entered the ark and no one who also come out until God had finished his work. In other words, when a time comes, if you were not found in Christ Jesus, if you were not found in Christ Jesus, then there's reserve for you, there's only reserve for you condemnation and eternal death. At that time, that is not a time to try to rush to enter Jesus. And when you look at the principle of theology of typology, you can see that it is impossible for anyone on the day of judgment, on the day when that person's life is about to end, when it starts about to end, and after that judgment, that's not a time for that person to accept Jesus. That's why I don't believe in it. I don't believe that when somebody has lived all his or her life here on earth, and is about to pass away, just at the 11th hour, the last day or the last minute, that he calls for the priest to pray for him, and then the priest can have the power to now usher him into the ark. It's not possible. You must have entered the ark before God shut the door. And if we're in the ark, you cannot come out to save your brother or sister or family member or friend that you have been witnessing to all your life and has refused to heed your word. You cannot then come and save you. In other words, if you have been a believer all your life, you are in the ark. God has shut you in Christ Jesus. And then, you know, you decide that because your close relative is at the point of dying, you know, breathing his last, now you decide you want to come out and usher him to be with you in the ark. You want to come out and take him inside. It is not possible. It is not possible. Just if you agree with me, say amen. Therefore, the time is now. 
The time is now. God said, his word is not beyond the seas. So I said, who will go and get it for us? The word is near you. The word is in your mouth. The time is now. Clap your hand for Jesus. In the book of Genesis, we see a presentation of God as a holy and righteous God. God is presented throughout history in his book as a holy and righteous God who sends flood in judgment against sin. Flood of judgment against sin. And yet, mercifully, saves Noah and his family because of their righteousness. Just say righteousness. Because of their righteousness. Not because of their handsomeness. Not because of their wealth, power, fame. Not because of their achievements here on earth. But simply because of their righteousness. That is all. That is, that is, that is the, the criterion. That is the qualification. Righteousness. Shall I say again, righteousness. righteousness. Clap your hands for Jesus. So my brother and sister, hearing me, wherever you are on the face of the earth, whether you are one of our branches in Niboy Town, Teshi, Michelle Camp, what matters? The, the, the qualifying criterion is righteousness. And let me say again that these days we are, we are surrounded, we are encompassed by so much sin, so much godlessness. And it comes in different shapes and colors. It comes in different shapes and colors. And it is unfortunate, sad, that even though the world, the world refuses, the world refuses to imbibe, to swallow, or even take anything out of the church, the world is not willing to take one thing out of the church. The church, rather, is taking many things from the world into the church. The world, rather, is taking many things that belong to the world, to be, to be, that belong to outside, into the ark. Imagine if Noah had taken anything that God says should not go into the ark. If Noah had taken even one thing from outside and then went into the ark with it, do you think God would have been very pleased with him? The Bible said that God did exactly what, sorry, Noah did exactly all according to what God told him to do. We are in a time when the way we dress, believers, the way we dress, belong to the world. Not all of us. Many of us, all over the world, we dress as if we are unbelievers. We dance to the tune of worldly music. When we have receptions, in the, when we have a wedding in the house of God, we come before God, and, but at the reception, it's a different thing altogether. In the house of God, during the wedding, it's a holy thing. But once we go to a reception, we allow the unbelievers to overwhelm our takeover. And then we dance their dance. We hear their music. We dress their dress. Some of them will go and even change. They change the wedding dress into wor wedding dress into worldly dress. And dance worldly dancing. We are in that age where now our ladies, they all have nail extensions. Very long nail extensions. I don't know where they got that from. And it's not nice. It is not nice. If they think individual, it is ugly. Nail extensions in different colors. We are at a time when God, God made man to have black hair, brunette, blonde. But now we're having hair in all kinds of colors, yellow, red, violet, rainbow colors, hair, and they don't look nice. They don't look nice. Not to mention the trans and other things that I mentioned already, but a whole lot of things are going on 
Now, beloved, if you are not careful, if you are not careful, you take on so many things from the world because of maybe where you live. Ghana, your environment there, people are very fashionable. You live in Tema here, people are known to be fashionable. When you go to a village, it's not so. People dress here in a fight, so you want to dress with them. When you go to the village, the way they dress is not so. So, if we, some of the dressing we dress in Tema, if we take the village, everybody will stare at you. They will stare at you. Hello? We are in an age where now men, the young men, even the old men, are making all kinds of hair hairstyles. You know, um, some of them, in fact, when, when we were young, when we were growing up, the hairstyles that we see the men do now, not the ladies, the men, the hairstyles that they do, you know, the one that is, you know, Chucha Jose, you know, we call them person, person, one, huh? that kind of hairstyle belongs to, when you see that, it's only mad men. Mad men, the lunatics. Those with manic, manic depressive psychosis. Mad men, hmm? fetish priests. Fetish priests. They used to do that kind of hair. Mad, the mad, fetish priests. And then Rastafarians. But now we are seeing that in the church. We are seeing that in the church. Let's all be very careful. God said, come into the ark. Come into the ark. There are some things you cannot come into the ark with. They belong to the world. They belong to the outside world, not inside the ark. Let's be very careful. Now, when you look, when now we look at this ark in the New Testament, you're not going to look at now what Christ meant. We have just mentioned what we have meant in the New Testament. Now, Jesus spoke of the flood of Noah and the ark. He spoke about it. With that, it happened. He just spoke about it. It actually happened. It's not that a fable. It's not a fiction. It happened. So Jesus spoke about it. And he compared it. He compared the days of Noah. Jesus compared the days of Noah with the time of the coming of the Son of Man. He didn't just compare the ark with anything. But he compared the ark in the light of the days of Noah. Noah's days, what was going on. And what we going on at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew 24, 35 to 39. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24, verses 35 to 39. Matthew 24, reading from verse 35 to 39. Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But on that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also with the coming of the Son of Man be. No other days, if we read the, we the story, uh, they were doing all kinds of things. They were doing exactly, they were doing all the things that we are doing today, we are doing today. There's nothing happening now that has never happened before, it has never been seen before. They were eating, drinking, making merry, marrying, being given in marriage, they were doing, buying, selling, until the flood came and took them all away. So will it, so will it be. When the Son of Man comes again. Let's look at Luke's Gospel to the 17. Luke 17, 26 to 30. Luke 17, verses 26 to 30. Luke chapter 17, verses 26 to 30.
And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, it was also in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. And on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man revealed, is revealed. You can say always God will take out the righteous. Lot, as soon as Lot left, then God opened the heavens, fire and brimstone. As soon as Noah entered the ark and God shut them in, then the waters. And the Bible said the fountains of the great deep you see, it rains, but when you look at the Bible carefully, it says on that day, all the fountains of the deep were opened. And the heavens were opened. So the water was just pouring from heaven and also coming from underground. Coming from underground. The fountain, all the fountains, the deep, were open. You know what the fountains are? Water shooting up. Up. So all the fountains are deep. Were opened. So water was coming from, from, the, from the earth. And pouring from heaven. No chance for anyone. No, no route of escape. There are other references to the flood in the Bible. Many references. Hebrews 11 verse 7. Hebrews 11, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. Hebrews 11, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Now look at this. By faith, Noah was divinely warned. Not like we are warning the whole world. Anyone hearing my voice now is being warned. He's being divinely warned. Noah was warned, and he, with godly fear, prepared an act to save himself and his household. In the same way, the world has been divinely warned for centuries now, just like you are hearing me now. So God is saying that prepare your ark. Prepare your ark to save yourself and your loved ones. Save yourself and your loved ones. And the Bible said that Noah, by doing this, condemned the world. That's why the rapture will come. That's why the rapture will come. Because God will never destroy the righteous with the ungodly. God never, one of his attributes is that he separates the righteous from the wicked. He will never destroy one righteous person with the wicked, with the unrighteous, with the sinner. So unless, until the righteous person leaves, God cannot bring judgment. So the day that Noah entered the ark and God shut them, God said, Noah condemned the world. Now, God was free to destroy the world. The day that the Holy Ghost would take all believers away, that we call the rapture, when all believers will be raptured, raptured every believer will just be, will be just taken up. Just like Elijah was taken up. Just like no, uh, Enoch was taken up. When all the believers are gone, then God can then do to the sinners here on earth what he wants to do. And it's a fearful thing. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. When God came into ministry many years ago, one of the things that he showed me was that 
He showed me with a, he showed me a great fire, fire like a furnace, and a big basket full of human beings. There were so many that they were they were in the size of ants, but they were human beings. The basket was so big, and the, the people were so many that they all looked like ants. And a hand was pouring them into the fire. And God said, that's how it will be on the day of judgment. That's how exactly how it's going to be on the day of judgment. And I woke up sweating. I've never forgotten that, that dream. First Peter 3, 20 to 22. First Peter chapter 3, verses 20 to 22. First Peter chapter 3. Verses 20 to 22. First Peter 3, verses 20, 21, and 22. Who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark, ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. There's also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Bible is saying that Jesus is the antitype. Like I said, the ark of Noah is a type. The real thing, the type is the shadow. The real thing is what we call the antitype. So Jesus is the antitype of the ark. In the same that, well, it took a hundred years for Noah to prepare the ark. One man, carpenter, prepared. It took me a hundred years. He was five hundred years old when he began to build the ark, and he, God waited patiently by the long-suffering attribute of God. God was able to wait. All the sinful things were going on, but God was not in a hurry to act. Not until Noah had finished. 100 years, God waited for Noah to finish the ark. And Noah was 600 years old when he finished building the ark. And all the 100 years, the long-suffering nature of God waited, seeing all the filth that was going on waiting for the time when the iniquities of the Amorites will be completed. Then when Noah entered, then God acted. And that's how it's going to be. And it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And if you agree with me, say amen. amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Second Peter 2, 2 Peter 2, is it 4 to 9? Second Peter chapter two, verses four to nine. Here we're looking at the judgment of God, the righteous judgment. Second Peter chapter two, verses four to nine. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved for judgment. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward will live ungodly. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. Verse 8 says, For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for a day of judgment. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What I want to emphasize here is that the Bible says that righteous love, so righteous Lot, Lot was righteous. 
dwelling among the sinners. Church, notice carefully. Lot was righteous. He dwelt among sinners, whether in Europe, Japan, anywhere in the world. We dwell among sinners. Tormented his soul. In fact, his soul was tormented. He was tormented. He was, he was being afflicted. Seeing and hearing what was going on. Seeing and hearing what was going on. He was tormented. Now, the point is this. This is the thing. If we're a believer, or you claim to be a believer, and we dwell among sinners, and a lot of things are going on, and these things don't, don't torment you. In other words, you see what is going on, and you are very happy with it. You are very comfortable with it. You don't feel tormented or afflicted, then there's something wrong with you. Then you are becoming a friend of the world. And friendship of the world is enmity with God. Lord, even in those days, I don't think what, what we are doing was anything compared to what we are seeing now. The Bible says he tormented his soul, hearing and seeing what was going on. That righteous man, so one, one, one criteria, one, one thing, the litmus test, the way you can test your own holiness, righteousness, is how do you see what is going on? How do you see it? If what is going on in the world now torments you, in fact, it gives you sleepless nights. It makes you worried. And sometimes it can make you cry. Lord, what is going on? If, 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 if you don't see it this way, but you are comfortable with it, or even you are not joining them in the way you dress, the way you are, the way you talk, the way you do things, you are joining them, then it means that your soul is not tormented. Then you cannot claim to be righteous. You cannot claim to be righteous. No, sir. No, madam. Especially when you join them in the thing that they are doing. Because verse 8 says, For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Hello? Oh, hello? Praise the Lord. In conclusion, 2 Peter 2 9. Conclusion, 2 Peter 2 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust and the punishment for the day of judgment. Again, Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Verse 15, 22. Psalm 34. Final scripture is Psalm, Psalm 34. Verse 15 to 22. Psalm chapter 34. 15 to 22. The Bible says that, verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, just as his eyes are on Noah and his family. Lot and you and me, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. So, if you want God's eyes to be on you, be righteous, then his ears will be open to your cry. He said, The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth, cut off their remembrance from the earth. The righteous cry at verse 17, and the Lord hears. May the Lord hear your crying. When you pray, may the Lord hear you, church. May the Lord hear your prayers. The, right, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears it. The Lord hears. And deliver them out of all their troubles, church. May the Lord deliver you out of all your troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. That's a humble heart. And save such as have a contrite heart. Once you are broken and contrite, the heart that is completely yielded to the Lord. Not questioning, not arguing, not debating, not disputing. Yielded completely. That's a, 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 that's a, a broken and a contrite heart or spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, 
And the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones. Church, may the Lord guard all your bones. Oh, I didn't hear your amen properly. May the Lord guard all your bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked. And those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. And none of those who put, none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. And none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Not one, not even half of those who trust in him shall be condemned. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. 